Trent Canada. Charlie Fox, Peter Baker, dog. I'm approaching your field at 5,000 feet. Request landing instruction. Over. Charlie Baker, dog. This is London Tower. Runway number one zero. Call me when on final. Over. London Tower. This is Charlie Baker, dog. Roger. Out. Aircraft coming in from all quarters of the sky, sometimes one every two minutes, laden with men and cargoes of all nations, make this new port of London one of the junctions of the world. They call it Heathrow locally. A few years back it was seven square miles of quiet Middlesex countryside. It was in April 1944 that history came to these country fields. An airport was required to finish off the Japanese, an airport for heavy, far-flying aircraft. An immediate need with an eye to a peaceful future. That was the beginning. <laughs> And the landscape was changed and the past obliterated. Then from the huge cement mills, oceans of concrete like heavy lava poured forth to form the solid runways. Specimens of the concrete are tested to destruction point in machines which develop pressure of over 50 tons to the square inch. Now as the runways stretch forth under the hands of the concreting gangs, the bulldozers, scrapers and grabs run out before them, preparing more ground and digging trenches for the complicated system of drains and cables that lie below the concrete. At the end of 1945, number one runway was complete. On this first day of the new year, this uh, proving flight starts off from Heathrow, which will be the future civil airport of London. And it takes off from the finest runway in the world. January the 1st, 1946, with one runway in service and two others near completion, Heathrow officially became London Airport. Thus, in under two years, British engineers had built and were operating one of the largest civil aerodromes in the world. But those were still pioneer days, and it was a time of flux and improvisation. 
marquees, caravans and RAF huts were the airline offices, custom sheds and passenger lounges in those days. It was like a circus, but it was also history in the making. The local inhabitants, however, see things from a different angle. To the older ones, it must have seemed strange indeed to see giant aircraft roaring down paths that once they knew as pleasant loitering lanes. Stranger still to see the streams that they had known since childhood turned aside from their old winding courses to new straight concrete beds. And strange to see the familiar farms swept from the earth as though by a whirlwind. And surely the unkindest cut of all, a few of their pubs may have to go. But for many, it has meant changes of a different kind, and a lot have found work on the site, for the port is still building. Each time a pilot comes in from the other side of the world, he sees new changes. From this busy frontage of control towers, offices and hangars, are drawn all the skeins of the web of the world's airways. This port has been founded. It has come to stay. Already it provides every scientific facility and every type of information necessary for the safe navigation of the air. But fog and mist, wind and rain, these are the chief hazards of the air. The Met Office is in touch with weather stations all over the world. But no matter how evil the weather, how thick the sky with fog or cloud or rain, there is still the airport's magic eye, which sees the pilot safely to land. Black and blind, the 